what you get is a via hole which is badly drilled. Yeah, if your drill's blunt, you end up with a ragged hole. That poor quality hole then gets poor quality plating in it. Um, so um, if, if that electroless plating doesn't take smoothly, then the plating that you put over the top isn't smooth and you end up with a hole where you have very thin areas of plating. Fiberglass goes plastic at 165 degrees C. We put that poor defenseless piece of FR4 into a wave soldering machine at about 260 degrees C. So it expands very quickly. And if you don't have good plating in your via holes, the via hole goes open circuit. And if you've got 500 via holes and 100 of them were drilled by the same drill, you've got 100 potential failures, which look like a tracking failure on your board that you don't find until final test or functional test or whatever. So if your goods inwards guy can put a bare board or a, a, an AQL level sample of bare boards into your x-ray machine, um, and you know, you, you, you've, you've amassed a huge cost for something that your goods inwards inspector can check in five minutes. That's my guest, x-ray expert, Keith Bryant, next on Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to episode number 42. My guest on this episode is Keith Bryant. I've known Keith for several years, bumping into him at airports, exhibitions, and conferences. Keith has presented at a few of our reliability workshops that I've produced and is no stranger to the lecture circuit. Keith has over 30 years experience in the electronics manufacturing industry. While he began his career in the circuit board fabrication industry, later moving to advanced materials and soldering systems, he is better known as an expert on X-ray and AOI technology. Keith has worked as a global sales director of a leading X-ray manufacturer, and more recently, he started a consultancy where he pursues projects including Industry 4.0 and advanced X-ray tube technology. Keith was chairman of the European-based Smart Group for 11 years and is now chairman of SMTA Europe and is an SMTA International Leadership Award recipient. I spoke to Keith from his office in England. Hey, Keith Bryant, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here, Mike. It's been a long time coming. You and I have known each other for many, many, should I say even another many years? Yes. Some people would say too many. Too many. Well, yes, that's probably true. Um, we've certainly been in this industry maybe too many years. But anyway, I'm really happy that you're on the program. You are my go-to uh, X-ray guy. Uh, we've done workshops together, and you're the guy with the cool slides because you get to see through things. You, you really have the coolest slides of all the different types of presenters that are out there. Yeah, a lot of them are black and white and grayscale, but they're still interesting, that's for sure. Well, you know, as a kid, if you ever dreamed of a superpower, you know, you know, do you, would you want to fly? Would you want to be invisible? Or would you want to see through things? I think when I was a kid, the see through things would have been my top, you know, probably for yeah, all the I wrong the reasons. I the specs as a kid, but they didn't work. No. <laughs> yeah, they just kind of made things blurry. So you thought you were seeing through something. So x-ray, you know, cool technology. Um, and it's, it's probably only second behind soldering in terms of how long the technology has been around. Soldering's been around for 5,000 years. I think they, they, soldering beats everything. But X-ray was discovered by a German scientist in 1895, you know, way before there were electronics uh, applications for X-ray. In fact, I read that it used to be called X-radiation, and the X was only because they didn't know what type of, re of uh, radiation it was. Is that a fact known to you um, as an X-ray expert? Um, yeah. I mean, be before Rontigan, who you're talking about, there was actually somebody else who uh, was working with it but didn't even know what it was or what it did. But, uh, yeah, he was, he was the guy that, you know, was ultimately responsible for everything. Mm. And, you know, a, a lot of people used it in the early days without realizing that uh, radiation is dangerous. Well, when I was researching this, this interview, I – 
you know, good old Wikipedia um, showed pictures of a tube, an x-ray tube, out in the open and a plate about three feet below it and a person's arm on the plate. You know, there was no shielding. There was no box. There was no warning light. Uh, and, and there was an operator standing right next to him. Now, I imagine that guy probably suffered some degree of injury from that. But, but a lot's changed. We've discovered that it's left to its own devices, dangerous, so it has to be contained. So obviously, we've come up with, with uh, ways to, to contain all that. What are the basic changes from 1895 to today? I know the technology is, the basics behind the technology are the same, but what are the major improvements? And I would imagine most of those are probably in the last 20 years, but what are the major improvements uh, with regard to x-ray and how it has been adopted for the electronic assembly industry? Okay. Wow. That's a, a, that, that's a big question. Hey, we have three right. hours, four, five hours, yeah. no problem. We have until we're okay. all we're all locked in. <laughs> we're not going yep, anywhere. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, the the early tubes were um, vacuum tubes made of glass. Um, reason for that was really just because that was the only thing that they could uh, um, make the tubes out of and seal a vacuum inside them. So basically, they made the tubes. Um, evacuated the air from them and then stuck a bung into the into the glass a little bit like a stopper in a bottle yeah, yeah. Um, kind of like a light bulb so, too. Yeah. The, yeah these these tubes were um generally used for um looking at people with broken bones and this kind of stuff um that was their main thing um and you obviously to to do that you needed um, a medium to make the image on because the tube makes the radiation. You set, you send the radiation through something and because different things absorb radiation differently, this is what makes your grayscale image that you see as a standard um, picture. You know, if, if you look at the, the early ones of broken bones, they were very much sort of black and white. There wasn't much grayscale. And today we say basically the detail is in the grayscale. But if you, you know, if you're looking for a, a fracture, it was you know black and then white and then black, so it it wasn't uh, that hard to see. Um, but uh, as the as the technology grew, um, people people were trying to image with all sorts of different materials. Um, film became the the popular one. Um, you know, I don't know if you can, if, if it happened in, in, in your neck of the woods as a kid, but I can remember when I was a, a teenager, I smashed my uh, right arm playing rugby and uh, went to the hospital. And, you know, after, after the, the x-ray, they, they gave me a, a large brown paper envelope that actually had the films inside them. And then the, uh, um, the, the, the doctor put the films up on a light box and looked at them. Sure. I remember um, those days. Yeah. Remember yeah, getting obviously. x-rays at the dentist, same thing, right? They yep, they yep. put the film in yep, your same. mouth and then they went in the dark room and then they stuck them on a board, a light board. Yep, and, and some dentists still work that way. Um, the, the next stage for us in terms of technology was a, an image intensifier which took the x-rays, put them through um, a series of, oh, whew, how would I describe it? Collimating lenses is probably the best way of putting it. Um, and then the, the image appeared on phosphor, um, which was um, radiation sensitive. Um, for us, uh, working in our industry, the, the higher the atomic number, the darker the image. So copper is less dark than gold. Um, air, obviously voids, is the, um, the, the least dark of all the things that you're going to see. So it's just a matter of uh, interpreting the image. But probably the, the two biggest changes were the move to what we call an open tube, which was no longer sealed for life. Um, the downside was it had a tungsten filament in it, and it had to be changed every, well, number of hours between 50 and probably 120 in the early days. But this produced... Um, first of all, it produced a narrower beam, which allowed us to see smaller features. And the target was actually on the outside of the tube. These are what they called transmissive. The early days of um, closed tubes were reflective. 
So the the anode was inside the tube, and basically you bounced the X-rays off the anode, and then they went through a window out of the tube. This meant that you couldn't get your sample very close to the anode. And the closer you could get to the anode or the target, the higher the magnification. So the, the open tube gave us higher magnification. It gave us the ability to see smaller features. But the downside was that we had to change the filament every time it broke. And that, that in the early days, it was almost like a tungsten light bulb. Mm. Um, then when um, the, um, it's actually quite interesting because the medical, the medical industry is responsible, obviously, for most of the um, technology growth in x-ray because that's, you know, that's where all the x-rays are, either in hospitals or dental surgeries or whatever. Um, they went digital. Um, the digital detectors weren't as sensitive as the old image intensifiers because, of course, we're, you know, we're looking at much smaller features than they are um, in the, the medical industry. Sure. Yeah, medical but, industry is looking at um, femurs and, and, and uh, uh, teeth, and the, uh, your industry, our industry, is looking at uh, wire bonds and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a difference of scale, but our industry adopted the – um, flat panel detectors, as they were called, um, very quickly um, because they didn't need to have lenses or anything to make the image flat. Um, you know, there was no um, there was no collimating needed because it was literally a flat panel imaging the X-rays immediately. Um, the downside for the the early adopters of this, who didn't realise, was that these um, these panels were not as what we call rad hard, not as safe for radiation as the image intensifiers were. Because of course, if you're using it in a medical application, you're taking one picture maybe every 20 seconds through a day. And in our industry, we're taking maybe 10, 10 images every second. Mm. So these very expensive early flat panel detectors um, had, a, had an average life of about six months. Um, and they cost tens of thousands of dollars. So you can imagine how popular people were um, who were supplying these when they found out that they were all failing within the time of the warranty. And in some cases, the people were having two, uh, two or three detectors during the warranty period. Um, it sounds like then radiation. between the early days of tungsten and its consumable nature and then these panels – which became a consumable, it looks like, the, at least in the early days of X-ray, it was quite an expensive operation, not just to purchase it, but to actually operate it. Oh, yeah. In its I day. Mean, very, very soon, they put lead piping into the uh, flat panel detectors, so they became radiation safe. And I mean, a, a detector now will last, you know, um, a, a magnitude of years rather than a, um, a, a few months. Mm. So, you know, things have improved. Um, then we have the um, flat panel detectors now who are pretty much made for our industry because as the industry grows, the, the volume comes and there, have been, sure. there are some specialist people out there who make them. So really, you know, going back up through the history, that's um, without, without a few sort of offshoots, that's pretty much where we are today. Um, I, I guess your next question is going to be where will we be tomorrow? Well, let's go um, there. Let's 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 just drive off the cliff and 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 follow that trajectory. Um, where are yeah, we going with well, this? Ov obviously, if you have a um, a, a, a machine that you want to put into your production line, um, you don't want unscheduled downtime when a filament breaks. Um, so I'm I'm doing some work at the moment with a, a Swedish company. Um, and they have they, they develop X-ray sources, and at the moment these sources are used in uh, biomedical. They're used in uh, natural uh, natural history, and they're used for science. Um, but we're looking at bringing them into the into the electronics market. Um, one of them, instead of using a tungsten anode, uses a jet of metal um, mixture of bismuth and indium and tin. So effectively, the uh, um, the target never wears out because it's 
you know, literally a flow of metal. Um, this also produces a beam which is very bright. And the, the brighter the beam, um, the more differences in contrast you can see, and also the, the lower differences. If you can imagine, you know, tungsten's about as high as as high as we go in the atomic number. So if you have tungsten together with silicon, it's very easy to see the difference. Mm -hmm. But if you have a void in a an, an, an additive material or an aluminium, then it's it's very hard to see because the color difference isn't so great. Um, so the brightness of these tubes helps. Um, and they have another tube um, which they're using as nano focus, which uses a, a very clever um, anode filament rather than tungsten. Um, and this has a life in terms of thousands of hours rather than hundreds. Um, so there is some new stuff happening. And also there are some detectors that are out there. Um, and, you know, there's, there's something that we've, we've talked about for a while within the industry. In fact, ever since lead free became a thing, um, X-ray has the ability to do spectrometry. You might have heard of the XRF guns and things that sure. these people just Look, looking for looking for counterfeits and and lead and yeah. things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And at the at the basic end, you know, the, these are the guys who work in you know the scrap metal industry who have a gun and they point it at it and they say, ah, yeah, that's aluminium. We'll give you so much a ton, and sure. that's iron. You can take it away or whatever. Um, so what what we're thinking is with everyone now trying to go lead free would be to set up a system within the detector where if the detector sensed the wavelength of lead, an alarm went off. Because a lot of people are very worried about having lead in their process if they're lead free. Um, you know, because you have mix, mismatch of materials and a lot of, a lot of other problems. Um, so, you know, we, we are, we're maybe now a few years away from a detector which will also detect whether you have lead in your system. So Keith, someone recently um, predicted that the next big change in the electronics industry will probably come from outside the electronics industry. Uh, rather than us reinventing the wheel, someone is going to have a wheel that we'll find useful. Um, it sounds like this new x-ray technology is, you know, its genesis was outside of our industry. Uh, and, and which X-ray has always been really. Um, so, so where's this coming from, and will it be available within our industry? And and will it be available through um, a new company, or will it be uh, will this will this new technology be adopted by the current uh, you know usual suspect X-ray companies? Well, the the the, the guys that I'm working with, um, um. I, I was going to say all they do is make sources, but effectively they, you know, they have a, a tube, a controller, a cable, uh, and a power supply. So effectively, it, it's an X-ray unit rather than just a, you know, just a random tube that you have to put up. They, they're not system integrators, so they have no interest in manufacturing a uh, system for themselves. I mean, the the Fraunhofer have uh, one of these things. Several other universities have. Um, their tubes, and they put them in cabinets that they've built themselves, customized for the work that they're doing. Um, but the you know the the logical step would be go to to go to a uh, company inside the electronics industry who already has uh, a system, and say, guys, you know this is going to give you the ability to see more stuff than you can currently see. And, you know, in the areas that we struggle predominantly, you know, the, the back end of semiconductor industry where we're trying to see um, copper pillars through silicon vias, all of these kind of things, which are just about on the edge of the technology that we have currently. Um, the, 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 the theory and the belief is that these tubes would take us further into that industry and also future proof us for the uh, SMT manufacturing. Um, because people using, as I said, people using inline machines don't really want to use um, tungsten filaments because of the, the downtime and all the rest of the stuff. Um, so the, um, the, 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 um, the metal jet technology uh, would last 
you know, in, in, in terms of systems, um, many thousands of hours without a failure and, and allow them to see a lot of the smaller features that they couldn't currently. Providing you could find a good uh, detector and a system to put in it and software to e analyze the image, then potentially you have something that's very exciting. But as I say, it's for, for, for these tubes, it's very early days yet. We're just um, looking at the electronics industry as a, um, you know, a, a, a new medium for them as they're looking at uh, additive manufacture because they believe that they've, they have some exciting stuff they can bring to the party. Um, but you know, currently they're looking at uh, uh, fossils and lace wings and doing chemical analysis and uh, a whole load of other exciting things with their tubes. So um, you know, it's a, a potential for the future. Yeah, it sounds like the the um, before we go on to another subject, just to kind of wrap this part of it up, we've gone from stark black and white to shades of gray. Uh, we've gone from uh, kind of a wide angle to a tungsten narrow focused uh, beam. We've uh, gone from film to panels. We've gone from panels that don't last long to panels that last long. And now, and I'm sure I'm skipping several, you know, uh, key points, but, and now the future is, is even finer, uh, being able to detect even finer features uh, with a much more robust technology that lasts thousands of hours. Is, is that, is that kind of a, a reasonable timeline of X-ray uh, progress. Yeah, I mean, as as you know, Mike, you know, everything has been getting smaller and smaller within our industry. Um, and you know, if if the components get smaller, then what's happening inside the components must get smaller. Um, I was going to say by the same amount, but actually, it's by a by a lot more. Yeah. So yeah, you know, the 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 industry has been 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 driven and. You know, we used to talk about millimeters and uh, now we talk about microns and soon we will be talking about nanometers in, you know, what we need, what we need to be, to being able to image, to make sure that the, that the product is going to be good when it gets to the end. I love talking about mistakes people make because it makes me feel good. <laughs> Everyone likes to point out mistakes other people make. In the world of cleaning, where I'm from, you know, I can tell you everything people regularly do wrong with cleaning. I mean, it's just, it's because that's the business I'm in, right? In your world, you see things through x-ray glasses, so to speak. What are some of the uh, common misconceptions regarding x-ray? And, you know, what do people buy them for the wrong reasons? Or do they at least, you know, think they need them for the wrong reasons? And, and what, are, what are the most common mistakes people make when using x-ray equipment? Oh, okay. Um, I, I guess the first common mistake and you know it, it it goes on to the fact that you know technology is move is ever moving forward and the demands on the inspection equipment become higher and higher um you know some some people and you know uh, a lot of the systems aren't aren't there anymore but some people will buy the cheapest x-ray system that they can because their customer says you have to have an x-ray system or I'm not going to give you an order or I'm not going to renew the contract or whatever. Right. There um, it is. There it is over there on the table. X-ray. It yep, says x-ray right. on it. Yeah. yeah. Check. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The guy who, the guy who drives it left a year ago, but uh, we still have one. <laughs> we still have one. Yeah. We see that too. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, you see it with cleaning machines, you see it with everything and you know, my comment to people is always don't buy what you need today, buy what you think you're going to need next year. Yeah, that's good advice. Because, you know, you are spending, if, if you're buying something reasonable, you are spending a lot of money. So, you know, it's better to spend that little bit more and have something that's future proof than in a year's time realize that the machine won't do what you want to do. Um, two, two little stories about that, I guess. Um, the first one was when the industry moved from using gold wire for wire bonds to copper. Um, obviously, copper sits lower down the atomic table than gold. And a lot of the machines that people had that were checking wire bonds uh, wouldn't see the copper. They could, they'd see gold all day long, but as soon as you change the material to copper, it became a nightmare. Mm. Um, 
now people are talking about wanting to change to aluminium and that really will be a struggle because uh, a lot of x-ray machines use an aluminium tray to put the samples on because aluminium is almost in it's not invisible but it's almost invisible to x-ray so um yeah you know that that was a big hit for the industry and the the, the high-end x-ray manufacturers suddenly found they had lots of sales on their hands <laughs> and the pre the prerequisite from guys and uh, it happened to me at an exhibition that somebody turned up with a sample and said, um, can you put this in and make a picture, please? And, you know, you, you oblige and you say, yeah, and you can see this and you can see this. And he said, oh, great, you can see the wires. And that was the beginning, the middle and the end of their interest. That was it. They either see them or they yep. don't. Yeah, because their current system couldn't see them well enough to wow. see um, breaks, to see um, um, problems with... Uh, diameter and all the other things so yeah that was a for, for the industry that was a, a very interesting one but my favorite if you want to talk about what the machines do um you you may have even heard me say it in presentations x-rays do not measure voids yeah um they, they don't measure voids measure, because they don't see no, air it, right doesn't that well, just show they, up as they, white Yes, but what, what the X-ray machine does is measure differences in grayscale, and it corresponds that grayscale difference to voiding. So if you turn down the sensitivity of your X-ray machine, the voids become smaller. If you increase the sensitivity of your X-ray machine, the voids become larger. So as I've demonstrated to people over the years, um, you give me a board and tell me what no level of voiding is acceptable, and I will show it to you on the machine. <laughs> He'll turn the dial until it reaches that number. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the biggest thing that, that people don't realize is that the machine has to be set up properly to give you an accurate void measurement. And even then, it's still, you know, a few percent plus or minus. So if you're, you know, if, if your customer says, I will accept a total of 20% voiding, then best set, set your system to a maximum of 17, and then you're always going to be on the safe side. <laughs> um, but if but if he takes it and puts it in a machine that's set to be um, heavily oversensitive, he's going to get a different reading than you anyway when he looks at the same component on the same board. So, yeah, that's, that's probably the hardest thing that people don't understand is that, you know, the best X-ray system in the world isn't going to measure voids. It'll measure grayscale more accurately than a cheaper one. But so, how does how does a user how does a user calibrate that? How, how do they you know rather than dial in what they want to see? How do they really dial in the truth? Where where is that truth found? Well, generally, I would say in the mid in the middle of all of the settings will give you the most accurate if the machine was set up properly when it was made. When it was um, made, but when it was made, not when yeah. it was delivered. When it was made, well, yeah, yeah. Sorry, when it, when it, when it, uh, when it was installed and calibrated. Okay, got it. Okay, I, I just didn't yeah. know if it, that was, you know, if some machines yeah. coming out of the factory floor are better than others, or no. So you're talking about when it's first installed, when it's calibrated, yeah. presumably by yeah. a manufacturer's representative yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. But you know, as as my great friend Dr. David Bernard says, uh, if you give it. If you give the machine its full name, it's an X-ray microscope. It's not mm. designed to measure things. Now, how much software is in a typical X-ray machine used for our industry that interprets what it sees? Is that uh, AOI has been doing that for years? Is is does X-ray do the same thing? Do they have a software package in algorithms and all this stuff? In today's yes. Um, I mean, the, the the very early machines in our industry that were, you know, I think the first one was from uh, Exelon, which we affectionately call the black box. And I think that <laughs> got into the, into the industry at 1986. Um, that was, to, 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 to give you an idea of quantifying the age, it had a thermal printer. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you look at today's, you know, I mean, Photoshop came along, you know, I, I guess in the 90s, which helped improve the image that the operator saw on the screen. Um, but now there are a whole load of 
um, algorithms and cleaning filters and a whole lot of other things that you can apply to the image, which will improve the image. And then there's a whole load of automated software which will automatically calculate the amount of voiding in a in a prescribed area and also um, the, the, the size of the largest total void, which are the two things that most people are um, interested in in terms of automated inspection. And you know, you, now you can set up an automated inspection routine to look at a panel which has a thousand uh, steps in it. And you can use fiducial recognition to set the um, the board up accurately on the table. So yeah, you know, there there is a a huge amount. And if we if we, you want to expand it a little bit and talk about back end semiconductor, I mean, you know, those machines actually have a need. Um, very good wafer mapping because if you're inspecting a wafer, you want to be able to know where all the bad wafers are or the bad um, dyes are, so you don't add any value to them any further along in the process. So yeah, software is uh, bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know, if we look at CT, you know, computer te uh, tomography, what some people call 3D, mm -hmm. um, then you're into a huge amount of software. Yeah, yeah, so much so where rendering time. Well, it, in the early days of CT, you would set a machine up overnight and you'd come back the next morning to look at what it had wow. done and hope to God you didn't screw up or you wasted like 10 hours. Um, but now you can do it in, you know, an hour. Some of the really high-end systems now work in a matter of minutes because obviously, you know, computer power is huge now compared to, uh, um, compared to what it was. So um, the, the, the higher the power in the computer, the faster you can do everything. Besides voiding, and I know um, I'll, I'll, I'll take your, your lesson on, you know, x-ray machines don't tell you if you're voiding, they measure grayscale. So, but besides trying to determine the amount of voiding uh, and maybe broken wire bonds and, and bad dyes uh, in a wafer, what, what are some of the maybe less um, common uses of x-ray that provide maybe an unforeseen value to, to some people? Ah, you're, you're, you're back on one of my favorite subjects. A long time ago, when I used to um, do operator training on machines that we'd sold, I always used to ask the guys, um, get your goods inwards inspector to be part of the x-ray training. And these people used to look at me strangely and said, no, 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 you know, we want the quality guys to do it. And I said, well, first of all, you know, it it's an expensive machine. The more the more use you get out of it, the faster your return on investment's gonna be. And, you know, it's not a hard machine to use. So basically any technician on the line should be able to take a board and look at it himself rather than having to go and find the QA manager or the responsible quality person and ask them if they could do it for them. Because I said, you know, it, it's a production tool. And they said, well, okay, I can see that, but why goods inwards? And I said to them, well, have you ever had any boards where at the end of the line in function test, you have random faults on them? And they say, well, yeah, we get it occasionally. And I said, well, yeah, do you know what actually caused it? And they said, well, no, we, we don't really get to the root cause. And you know, I have a bit of an advantage here because you know, I started my life in bare board manufacturing. Um, and what you get is a vial hole, which is badly drilled. Now that's the same as you taking your drill at home and drill and drilling through a piece of wood. And if you push too hard, you end up with a ragged hole. Right. Yeah, if your drill's blunt, you end up with a ragged hole. Exactly the same in PCB manufacture. Yeah, even if you stack your, your boards too high and you drill through more than you should, um, you'll end up with a poor quality hole. That poor quality hole then gets poor quality plating in it because the first thing you do is you put it in a bath of um, copper sulfate like we used to use when we were kids um, just for, you know, um, ter ma making pennies look new and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if if that electroless plating doesn't take smoothly, then the plating that you put over the top isn't smooth. 
and you end up with a hole where you have very thin areas of plating. Now, fiberglass goes plastic at 165 degrees C. We put that poor defenseless piece of FR4 into a wave soldering machine at about 260 degrees C. So it expands very quickly. And if you don't have good plating in your via holes, the via hole goes open circuit. And if you've got 500 via holes and 100 of them were drilled by the same drill, you've got 100 potential failures, which look like a tracking failure on your board that you don't find until final test or functional test or whatever. So if your goods inwards guy can put a bare board or a, an AQL level sample of bare boards into your x-ray machine, he can look at them from an angle. He can just quickly flip around the board and he can say, yeah, that's great. All the, all the edges of all the holes are smooth. It looks like there's enough plating in the holes. Um, I'm going to look directly from above. If it's a multi-layer board, I can check the alignment of the, of the layers because obviously these things are made now in big panels and you do get a little bit of movement across the panel and the inner layers have basically got to be where they should be. Um, he can check all of these things, and if he finds a fault, he can reject that whole batch of boards back to your bare board supplier, which maybe will cost you a day or two until you get some more, um, but you don't add the value of the production of making the board and the, the value of all of the components onto the board, then some cost for final test, and you end up having to throw it in the bin anyway. Mm. Um, and you know, you, you, you've, you've amassed a huge cost for something that your goods inwards inspector can check in five minutes. Interesting. It's, it falls under the category of it. It's amazing what you see when you look Yeah, and how you look. Yeah. That, yeah. I would not have thought of using x-ray for that purpose. Um, that's no people don't because you know, it's, it's a bare board. It's been bare board tested. Sure. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the, 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 but, not, nails but, not, just says, but not exposed to thermal excursions, which is exactly, yeah, the, you know, the, the better nails just says, yeah, there's a connection from here to there where it should be. Um, it doesn't say that, it, as you say, it, it's going to live in the real world. And you know, it, if you don't have failures in final test and you're putting it into a harsh environment, you're probably going to have failures in service, which are going to cost you a huge amount more. Sure. Absolutely. In, in profit in uh, reputation in all sorts of tangible yep. and intangible areas. So you're going to build a board that's going to keep you alive and mm -hmm. you need to inspect it. Uh, you need to inspect it with x-ray and the quality of the inspection determines whether you live or die, Keith. So, um, so tell me, you used to have a horse in the race. You used to sell x-ray equipment. You're kind of a free agent right now, so you're not um, tied to any technology. Uh, what are the uh, things that you will look for? What are the benchmarks? What are the qualities or attributes of a technology that you would insist on to keep you alive? Um, it's very simple, Mike. It's all about the image, and I don't mean whether the machine looks pretty or not. I mean the image <laughs> that, that the operator <laughs> sees on the screen. Right. Um, you know, if, if you can see all the potential faults, you can accurately measure um, the voiding. Um, pretty much you're there. Um, obviously, the, 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 higher, you know, the, the higher you go up the, the price scale, the better these machines perform and the more accurate they will be. That's what I was going to ask and you. What probably, does price buy you? What yeah. is it, it buys you a better image, basically? Yeah, well, a, a better tube, a better detector, and better software. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, the box is the box is the box. It's a piece of steel with lead in it, and as long as it has all the right safety locks and everything else, um, then it doesn't really matter. But yeah, you know... That, that's that's the first thing that you would want. Obviously, if you're in a manufacturing environment, you want reliability and you, you want ease of use and a whole load of other things. But, you know, if, if you're talking about what what I'd be interested in to keep me alive, um, pretty much it's something that accurately measures voids. Mm -hmm. And uh, pe people always used to ask me and still do, and they say, Keith, you know, what's the safe level of voiding? And the ultimate answer is the safest level of voiding is no voids at all. And providing you have 
full joints um, and not reduced joints in terms of the amount of solder that's in them, then that is the safest thing. But of course, that's completely unrealistic. Um, but what I say to people, it's quite simple, is, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning and I'm going to eat toast. And if there's a large void in my in one of the components of my toaster and the toaster breaks, then I'll eat cereal. <laughs> and not that, we're, not that we're doing it at the moment, but I, as you know, I used to fly a huge amount. And I'd say, well, you know, in, in a week's time, I'm going to be on a plane to X. Um, and if there, are a lot, if there are large voids in the BGAs on the guidance system of that aeroplane, then I'm not really going to worry about what I'm going to eat for breakfast the next morning. That's true. You might be on a plane to Y instead of X. Who knows? Yeah, or, or you might be on a plane that uh, goes down rather than along. <laughs> so um, in our industry, probably in every industry, not just related to the electronic assembly industry, there are reputable players, there are sketchy players, there are people who want your money and will deliver the least possible. There are those that uh, provide real value without naming any names, what, does that also apply to X-Ray? Do you kind of get what you pay for? Are there machines out there that you would really prefer people avoid or um, machines out there that you think are a home run that, that you know, you'll never get fired for buying XYZ? Or is that out there or are they all pretty good? As a general rule, the industry is... Um, continually improving as the you know the the technology improves. Um, you know, I I always used to, to to say to people even when I was uh, um, selling in the industry, you know, go to a large exhibition. You know, go go to um, go to an apex. Take a sample with you which you think is a demanding sample. Take it around to all the guys who are there. Um, ask them to put it in their machine and make some pictures um, and look for the picture that gives you the most detail and look for how easy it is for the guy to make that image. Um, you know, we, we have some systems where um, you still almost need to be uh, a doctor of x-ray or a scientist to get good pictures out of them. You have some systems which won't produce really good pictures of demanding things. Um, and you have other systems where, you know, it, it, it's, it's what I described earlier as a production tool. And, you know, anybody working in production should be able to use it. And, you know, if, if I was looking for something, it would be something that was accurate, something that was reliable and something that was easy and straightforward to use. Um, and also, you know, the, the, the key thing, if we're looking at um, measurement, you know, it's, it's got to be repeatable. There are still very low-cost machines out there, which um, you know have almost come from what I would call forensic autopsy. You know, where they they put a component inside. Uh, sorry, they they put an or, an organ inside and uh, close the door and have a you know have a look at it directly from above. Right. I mean, you know, in, in this day and age, you need an angled view to give you an idea of what's happening, and ideally, an angled view where you tilt. The detector rather than tilt the sample because if you tilt the sample away from the tube you reduce the magnification so yeah you know there there's um different horses out there for different courses but yeah you know the the, the higher end ones are all pretty good and how close are we to just having an average line operator run an x-ray machine uh, is that possible today if it's set up properly in advance or is it still an art you know like a like an MRI machine or an, any kind of medical imaging machine. They're always reviewed oh, by, no, you know, no, technicians. It's, 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 it's not that tough. It's not that tough. Um, you know, if, if you have a machine, which you, you, you basically, you put the machine in, you, you make the picture of what you want to look at, you click save, that becomes step one of your program. You set the next image, you click save, that becomes step two. Then you can put a semi-skilled operator in there. They open the door. They put the board in against the board location, um, and they push start, and the machine will step and repeat around every one of those areas. And on the screen in front of them, they'll have a golden board image of what's good, and they'll have the real image, and they click a button, yes or no, 
Um, and if they click no, they have to put in some reasons. If they click yes, it moves to the next step. Mm. So yeah, I mean, not only is it down to uh, operator level, you know, with a with a program, you can run it with uh, semi skilled operators. Oh, very good. It has come a long way. Oh yeah. Hey Keith, before we go, we're starting to run out of time. One thing I love about doing these things is is an hour is seems like like five minutes. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It's a great conversation. So here, here's where I want to end. You've been in the x-ray industry for uh, 10,000 years, and uh, you've, seen, you've seen it all. I know that because you and I have shared war stories uh, in the trenches before. So give me a, a, a real example of like from a case history that you were involved in or that you're aware of uh, where there was a problem, there was a solution. Take, take it away, Keith. Okay. Um, we're at an exhibition and a guy turns up with a board and he said, this board has just failed on a wind turbine that was offshore in Scandinavia. And we're getting lots of these failures. The guy who assembles our boards says there's nothing wrong with them. They're fully tested and fully inspected before they leave. Um, but we're getting lots of failures. Could you have a look at it? So as a willing techie, um, you're always happy to look at this stuff and you're thinking, oh yeah, you know, blown gold wire inside it because it's uh, seen some form of voltage spike or power or something because you know these things are um, handling a lot of current in some areas. And uh, looked around the board and there was one component that, caught my eye because the, the, the shape of the solder joint didn't look quite, all I could describe it is quite right. Mm -hmm. And with a bit more investigation and looking underneath it at an angle and the via hole looked like it didn't have any plating and a ring around the top. And obviously that would have created an open circuit, but if the board had been like that all the time, then, you know, it wouldn't have ever got assembled. And if it got assembled, it would never have got out of the factory. So um, we dug a little bit further and with X-ray, we couldn't see anything more, but I left the guy with the pictures and said, you need to find out what's happening um, at the, you know, the, the board level assembly stage. Um, because I said, you know, there's, there's something weird and this via hole didn't just, you know, lo lose its plating for no apparent reason. Um, long story short, these guys were using um, components which they bought on the gray market because they couldn't get um, the components and the, and the customer was pushing them very hard for delivery. And these components didn't solder very well, I guess, because they were old or they hadn't been stored properly. And one of the ladies on the production line retouched the joints with cord wire that she was um, using um, from the back of her drawer that she'd had from the, in inverted commas, good old days. Sounds like she did um, a little solder and, sculpting rather than soldering. No, no. It was even better than that because the cord wire she was using was a water washable. Oh, so it had a flux in it that was yeah. not designed to stay on the board. An organic acid Unfortunate, flux. Unfortunately, they were using a no-clean process. So it stayed. So the boards never got cleaned. And as we all know, OA flux remains active and corrosive after reflow. Yep. And the boards were OSP finish. So effectively, the via hole had a ring of bare copper around it. Mm. And the bear copper got eaten over time because, of course, it's a perfect environment. You know, it's got moisture, it's got humidity, oh, it's, it's got perfect. all it's, of those yeah, things. Yeah, it's a poster child for harsh environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was probably that definitely the most interesting one that I've come across. You know, you find broken wires, you find components that aren't made properly. Um, you also, I mean, didn't didn't get into it, but. You know, a, a lot of the counterfeit components, you know, they have the same labeling on the outside that the, that the real ones do, but inside the die is different. The gold wire layout is completely different. 
So, you know, another good use of X-ray at goods inwards is if you're buying expensive components, because obviously nobody's going to counterfeit the cheap ones. Um, if you're buying expensive components, then, you know, that's another job for your goods inwards guy is to check them against the known good picture, which is saved in the library to make sure that what you've bought is what it says on the tin. Yeah, very good. And, and I imagine, uh, I know counterfeiting has been a huge problem over the last many years. I, I would imagine uh, with shortages of components that IoT, Internet of Things, is, is partially driving, that, that the, the opportunity for counterfeit parts is, is as high as it's ever been. Yeah, and with this wonderful COVID-19 uh, COVID that we have at the moment, when things start ramping up again, um, it's going to be an ideal time for counterfeiters to make a fast buck. Sure, just slip a few in, no one will notice, yeah. Oh, very good. Keith Bryant, you uh, you never cease to amaze me with the depth of knowledge on X-ray and all things related. How do people get a hold of you? Why should they get a hold of you? Um, and, and tell me what you're doing right now. Uh, well, a, a whole wide variety of stuff beyond X-ray because, you know, as a techie guy, I've spent a lot of time in process and uh, doing a, a, a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of industry-related things, and I really like uh, solving problems and uh, doing uh, um, stuff that, I don't know, it, it, it sounds a little bit weird, but stuff that helps people. Um, you know, I'm at the moment, I'm well, b before the virus, I was doing factory audits for um, quality and process improvements, uh, quality, quality audits where people were looking to check that they were working at the appropriate standards, um, to um, writing technical articles for people, um, doing presentations, um, giving them advice on X-ray, other related technology, um, how does X-ray fit in with Industry 4.0, and pretty, pretty much uh, and anything which is uh, interesting. Yeah, very good. And if someone, I'm going to put your contact information in our show notes. So for those listeners who want to just click on a link to get in touch with Keith, uh, look at our show notes. Uh, if you don't have them on the platform you're listening to, go to Spreaker.com. That's where our show is hosted and the show notes are all there. Keith, uh, give us your uh, email address if you don't mind. Uh, Keith, K-E-I-T-H at KeithBryant.net. Very, very easy, very simple. If you, if you can remember the name, you can remember the email. Keith Bryant, and that's B-R-Y-A-N-T, right? That's correct. Keith Bryant. Say, and say, net say is, one more is N-E-T. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's morning time for me in California. It's late afternoon in England where you are. So I, I, I can still, at this time in the morning, spell net. Maybe by the afternoon. With all this home isolation <laughs> stuff, who knows? I might not be able to spell my own name, but right now I'm in good shape. But uh, good. Thank you Perfect. so much for joining me. Are you staying safe? Are you? Are you? Uh, are, is life uh, have some resemblance to normalcy in in your part of the world, or is it just as crazy well, there? Well, it's it's it, to be honest, for my life, it's no resemblance to normalcy. You know, I'm doing I'm doing everything web based, either doing stuff or listening to stuff. Um, but you know, I'm probably one of the few people who's rejoicing in being in the same time zone for a certain number of yeah. uh, weeks and also not having to get on airplanes or live in airports. So right. Your I'm normal still, place I'm, of I'm, residence is 17A or 36C, you know, some airplane seat, right? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it is, it is just so nice. Um, you know, to be to be sitting here looking out at the garden, even though we've got an English uh, rainy day. But you know, it's it, it's quite good. I mean, the the lockdown here is fairly serious. We have an hour's exercise a day, and we can go out for essential things like shopping and visiting the pharmacy. And apart from that, the the advice is for everybody to stay at home. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, Keith, my friend, thank you. Stay safe. And thank you for being my guest today. I really, it's been a long time coming. I'm glad you're on today. And, and uh, thank you for all the value that you're uh, providing our audience. 
Well, Mike, thank you very much. As you say, it's it's been a long time, but uh, it's been really good. It's been really fun, and I've enjoyed it. And please, you know, stay safe with that end and the, the whole of the family, too. Thank you. All right, right back at you. Thank you very much, Keith. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast. Reliability Matters and other reliability-based podcasts are available at Circuit Assembly's PCB Chat at PCBChat.com and at Ascendo Reliability at Reliability.fm. Thanks for your comments. Please keep them coming. Send comments and episode suggestions to Mike at MikeConrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Until next time, thanks for listening and keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.